Wonderful. Welcome to the How to Health Podcast. I'm Dr. Lori Marbus, and today I'm beyond honored to have Dr. Richard Cremona, the previous Surgeon General of the United States, here to explain to us so much of his wisdom and share some knowledge and hopefully some good ideas that we can use as physicians and just Americans in general to promote our health. So how are you doing today, Dr. Kamala? I'm doing well. Thanks very much and certainly appreciate the opportunity to be with you. Now, I'm beyond um, honored that you would take the time to let me interview you. And first of all, I want to say thank you for your service in not only the public arena, but as a military combatant um, service. I mean, you were enlisted and then you know, you went to become a medic in the special forces, and there's just so much to that. But I just want to thank you so much for your service. And honestly, to have the courage to be truthful when it was really difficult, I'm sure, in some of your your previous... Uh, well, back at you for your service as well. So <laughs> thank you. And as we know, uh, part of the, uh, the pillars of success of any uniform enlisted person or officer is integrity. And that That's is it. doing the right thing. Right, even when it's the most difficult thing to do. And often it is the most difficult. <laughs> Absolutely. I tell people it's kind of like parenting. Sometimes it's hard to do the right thing, but you still got to yes. do it. <laughs> yes. And, you know, and probably the, in that uh, combat zone we call Washington, D.C., it may be most difficult of all. Yes, absolutely. And actually, one of my questions I was reading, I was watching your videos and you had, you had described that as a combat zone, but we'll certainly get there. But, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, People, you know, may not know that you were raised by immigrant parents from Puerto Rico, and even there was a time that you were homeless when you were a young child, right? And yes. dropped out of high school, you joined the Army, that you wanted to join the Special Forces. They said you have to be a graduate of high school, so you got your GED, and that set you on your, on your way, and you became a nurse and a physician, and you're a law enforcement officer. I mean, there's just so much more to you as an incredible human. <laughs> but clearly, service is a part of your makeup. And so I always like to ask, because I think it's, it's a really fun mm -hmm. to understand in an, a person as a physician, what made you want to become a physician? I think it was a logical sequence of events. Uh, when I, I was always interested in science, and even though I dropped out of high school, uh, some of the first books I ever purchased or read were science books, trying to figure out how things work and why does this happen. And I remember, I still have a couple of the first books I bought, which was a a book on, on surgery uh, that I, couldn't, I didn't understand. So I bought a medical dictionary and I think I was 14, 15 years old and I just started reading and then they talk about drugs. So I went and found the PDR, but then I couldn't understand that. So I got a medical dictionary. So it just, that, that's where my interest was in science and how things work. And eventually when I went in the army at 17 and um, I went to the infantry airborne and then went to special forces, but because I was a high school dropout, I couldn't stay in special forces, so I got my GED. But then, I, and then I tested, and, and I tested to be a special forces medic, and, and that was the most coveted position. And so I'd been in the infantry already, and so I had a, a weapons background. Then I went into be a medic, and uh, you know that's independent duty corpsman, kind of like your Air Force doc. It's it's like the PJs in the Air Force, yeah. where you go into remote areas and you're it. If you can't take care of it, there's nobody else there to take care of it. Mm -hmm. And this is when I'm 19 and 20 years old. And wow. so, uh, uh, so I think that, and then being in combat and um, taking care of some of the most uh, catastrophic injuries you've ever seen. For you know what we call IEDs today, were booby traps back then in Vietnam, and seeing your friends die, and you know, and just just that that whole mix of things and thinking, you know, I, I want to learn more. I want to do, I want to do better. You know, at 19, 20 years old, I mean, I delivered babies in a rice paddy, you know, in a, in a firefight. And it was like, yeah, I took credit for it, but it would have happened even if I wasn't there, let's be clear, because, you know, most of the, most of the births in the world are unassisted. But, you know, just, I remember these little vignettes, a little girl that was shot, we found in a, after a, a firefight and our team kind of adopted her and she got better. She didn't have a name. She was a mountain yard girl. So I named her Linda because in Spanish, Linda is pretty. And she was a pretty mm. little girl. And so I, and I have the pictures, you know, and I saw those, all those flashbacks. But then I thought, okay. And um, eventually I, uh, I got the opportunity because I had mentors who believed in me, who gave me opportunity. I got promoted. I had, I had more responsibility. And then I had high school mentors who never forgot about me, who kept telling me I should go to college. And when I, and they were the ones who, when I came back from Vietnam, had uh, known that I had applied to all these colleges but got rejected. 
but they found a program in New York City at Bronx Community College that was open enrollment for combat veterans. And so they didn't care if I was a high school graduate. And that's how I started. And I got my GI Bill and, you know, so it was all of those things. And I kept thinking, well, this is unlikely. Um, you know, mom just wants us to get out of high school. Uh, I probably wasn't going to do real well, but then I got to college and I found it wasn't that difficult, mostly because I was very disciplined and focused, skills I learned in the military, and uh, became, a, you know, became an A student because I was the most disciplined, never the smartest, but the most disciplined and focused, and then went on to medical school and, you know, was fortunate uh, to get into a number of schools and went to UCSF, and uh, I thrived there because I just loved everything. I mean, it was one of those medical students that when I was on OB, I wanted to be a gynecologist. When I was on surgery, I wanted to be sick. <laughs> I just loved everything I was doing. And I skipped my last year. I graduated number one in my class and, uh, and went and trained as a general vascular surgeon and subspecialized in trauma burns and critical care. And, wow. but, in, in the, but, but I will say in that timeline, I failed many times. I just kept getting up. Get, if it was important, I just kept staying in the fight, stay in the fight, stay in the fight. And, ultimately uh did okay so Pers persistence will win yeah great time. country great country you know absolutely absolutely so then you were also involved in arizona you were part of their building their emergency response system is that correct i mean yeah, so yeah i was recruited uh, from ucsf after i'd done my training there and started and uh thought i was going to stay there as a junior attending low person on the totem pole you know taking all the weekend call and night call and and then I, I got this opportunity to come to Arizona, and it was at a time when uh, trauma was uh, trauma was kind of the uh, uh, was receiving a lot of attention, and there were not enough trauma surgeons. So most of us who had been trained in critical care and trauma, we had lots of opportunities. But the one opportunity was in Arizona where uh, they wanted the person to come in to be a director, and so and start the program and really you know build your own legacy. And I thought, okay, and my boss. Um, who was one of the preeminent trauma docs in the world, Don Trunke, who I trained with for many years, he told me you should do it. He said, you know, because if you fail, they'll just say you took off, you bit off too much when you were young. And if you succeed, you're going to make a name for yourself. <laughs> and, so, you know, in less than a year, we had, uh, you know, certified uh, trauma system. And uh, wow. I love doing it. And because my background was in pre-hospital care anyway, uh, you know, I did a lot of teaching with the medics, the EMTs and, I had, and it really was never work. I got up every day and I just enjoyed everything I was doing because I got to do everything I used to do as a medic and as a both military and civilian. And so uh, it was just fun. It was just wow. So tell me, how did the police officer or you were, you were working with the sheriff's office? How did that come about as a surgeon? Yeah. I mean, that's a, you were a SWAT. Yeah. Well, I, you know, my well, it was I had a I had previously been in law enforcement. And then when I got to Arizona and the state police had rescue helicopters and they said, well, will you come and be our medical director? Because, you know, uh, our guys do this all over the state of Arizona because a lot of it's so rural and you have a, you have a middle, military and law enforcement background. And so why don't you come and be our medical director? I said, okay, fine. I'll just look at it as a collateral duty. But then more and more when I went to training, you know, uh, with, with the SWAT guys uh, who did special operations. So special operations were guys did guys did SWAT, but they also did search and rescue. And so I, I was often at, well, can you show our guys how to repel better? Can you show them how to sh shoot better? Can you do this? And so finally the commander said, well, why don't you just go back to the academy and get your, and get your law enforcement certification and, you know, and just you'll be a police officer too. So I said, okay, but I can't do it full time. So they cut a deal with me. They said, okay, if you can finish all of your courses part-time and you know, you're going to do everything everybody else did, and then we'll sign off that you are a peace officer like everybody else. It's just like, you know, the academies are like 22 weeks and you have to just, you go away for 22 weeks. I said, I couldn't do that because I'm running the trauma system. So I did nights, I did weekends, I did breaks, and I did all my, I did all my training and then got my certification. And so I flew air rescue was the medical director. And then more and more, I started getting involved in, in SWAT. And it turned out I ended up being the, the tactical team leader. And I was working as a doc and as a, as a cop for years, both jobs. Never planned it, but I loved it because it allowed me to go back and be what we call an operator again, as I was in special forces. Right. Well, you know, from, you know, the only thing I wasn't doing was parachuting, but everything else <laughs> I got, everything else I got to do. And I really, capitalized on my military skills is, is what it was, you know, 
uh, combat casualty care, which uh, ultimately became what we call today tactical emergency medical support. And that's a program that a colleague of mine who was at LA County uh, SWAT, um, he and I founded that, that, that program and now it is a standard of care nationally. It's called wow. TEMS, Tactical Emergency Medical Support that uh, because of active shooters, because of IEDs, because of suicide bombers, that our nation has been forced to move that way, that we, the, a lot of the injuries we see in urban environments today are what we see in combat. Multiple gunshot wounds, explosions. You think of the Boston uh, Marathon tragedy and so on. Right. So law, up until then, law enforcement really wasn't prepared to deal with those things. They never had to. So it was a new threat. And because it was a new threat, we needed to have a way to provide uh, emergency medical support, uh, just like our military does. As you know, as, a, as, a, as an Air Force officer, you, you deploy, but you never deploy without your medical unit. And they're making sure the troops are health, healthy, you're battle, battle ready every day. They help the commanders with deciding on what the best personal protective equipment is. But in the civilian world, that didn't exist. So we built that model into civilian law enforcement starting back around 19, mid 80s, 1980s, and took a few years to get going. But now, uh, you know, American College of Emergency Physicians, College of Surgeons, National Association of EMS Physicians all have sections on, on what's called tactical emergency medicine, which is essentially combat casualty care in a civilian environment. Wow, that is incredible. So it was fun, but it was yeah. fun. Again, you know, you're not working if you get up every day and really love what you're doing. Exactly. Well, that's why I do this podcast. Is a, it's it's just a passion, and it's it's a side project among many things, and it's just so fun mm -hmm. to share messages that maybe other people wouldn't be able to hear. And mm -hmm. that kind of leads me to you know when you realize many of your patients had chronic diseases, right, and they were preventable, you returned even more school. I, don't, I have no idea. I went to medical school with three little kids and I know I was busy. I got an Ooh. MD, MBA and I can't even fathom doing everything you did with a job and you have a family as well, yeah. somewhere in there. Um, but you returned to school to get an MPH and you've written a lot about what we call health literacy. And I think those are terms that are not used as often as I would think I would like to after, as, as I'm reading about it and learning. Can you help us understand what that is and maybe what the components of that are and what yeah. we can do to help move it forward? Well, I, I refer to health literacy as kind of the missing link for all of us because uh, a, a lot of the challenge that we have is being able to translate complicated stuff that we know. You know, and today it's genetics, epigenetics, the human genome, pharmacogenomics, nutrigenomics, okay? But how do, you, how do you grab all that stuff, put it together, translate it in a health literate, culturally competent manner to deliver it to an end user, a fellow citizen we call a patient, to do one thing only, effect sustainable behavioral change. Stop smoking, walk more, don't eat this, eat that. So, you know, and it's, it, the equation is very simple. The difficulty is how do you craft messages? How do you develop credibility in, in this most diverse nation that we have, the most diverse heterogeneous nation in the world that is made up of hundreds and hundreds of languages and cultures and immigrants? And, and yet the very diversity that makes us so strong divides us every day. So there, there's the, this kind of Petri dish that we're all living in and things are changing all the time. And so... A number, number of years ago, uh, especially when I was Surgeon General, I started realizing the problem is not that we don't have enough information. The problem is we don't know how to adequately use this information. And I, when I, people say, used to say when I was Surgeon General, well, don't we need more research? I said, no, you know what? I think the research pipeline is constipated, is what I used to tell people, <laughs> okay? And what we do need is a laxative to get this stuff out. Okay, and, and believe me, I, as, an, as a researcher and a doc myself, I'm not, it's, I'm not saying anything derogatory. I'm just saying the translation part is the difficult part, okay? Because even today we know that if you have some idea on a great drug that's going to save the world, it's going to take 15 years to get out to the people. And there may be years more before they actually understand it and incorporate it. So what about public health practices? Everything from sanitation, exercise, vaccinations, and so it started dawning on me that I needed a better way to communicate. So I reached out with my team into that area that we, we didn't have much uh, experience in, health literacy. And really health literacy is 
taking the complex stuff that we know mm-hmm. okay, and being able to translate it so that when we deliver it to that fellow citizen who's our patient, that they understand it and they are able to act on that information to improve their health outcomes. Mm-hmm. So that sounds deceivingly simple, mm-hmm. but when you look at the disease and economic burden we have as a nation, and we're spending around 19% of our gross domestic product today, so almost one in five dollars, and and we say that's on health care. It's not on health care. It's on sick care, right? Because about three trillion dollars is the total, and when you look at the science embedded in that statement, about 75 to 80 cents of every dollar is spent on chronic diseases that we cause. So as the politicians beat each other up over whose plan is better and so on, that none of them are addressing the proximate cause of the disease and economic burden. You know, you can, whether you like the Affordable Care Act or don't like it, or you wanted the Republican plan versus the Dem, it doesn't make a difference because what we know is irrespective of which political party's in power, every time we switch and have another party in power or a new president, what we do know is the cost of care goes up and the disease burden goes up. It's independent of politics. Yet each side argues that their side is right. We see it playing out in front of us now. And, you know, their, their role is to uh, get reelected and keep their party in power. And by telling the truth, something we started with this discussion early on before it was important, <laughs> It, it, it's let's just say it's shaded often politically based on and both parties do it so my remarks are bipartisan right and, and, and the fact is the fact is is that um, every president over a century has tried to move forward some health program practices protocol but what what happened well the other party thwarts them okay it's not and 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 often each party overreaches and when they have power they try and push things through without providing a democratic process and both parties have done that in the recent past so when i look at that and i say is 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 our politicians going to solve our problem it will not uh in in fact they're as much an impediment at times as they are uh a a help to us moving things forward the challenge is is that the disease and economic burden continues to grow because of lifestyle problems okay lifestyle choices that are poor. So how do we get ourselves in there? How do we, as we look at a nation of 300 million people, and as Surgeon General, it's interesting, I travel to most of the states, and what you start to see is what uh, Tocqueville said hundreds of years ago. This is a strange place, this United States of America, because these 50 states are like 50 countries, and it's remarkable that they're kind of glued together. Because if you're in Seattle, and you give a health message, and then you go to Alabama with the same message, you're probably not going to fly. And not that one is wrong or right, it's that the culture is so different in all of our states, north, east, south, west, central. And, and many of these communities who have been there for centuries uh, still have some of those initial uh, cultural nuances that their ancestors brought to the country. So it makes us strong, but it also divides us. And so I started realizing, man, I just can't write a memo and say, Surgeon General orders you to be healthy. Okay? <laughs> and, and so what I need to do is figure out a way to better communicate. And so health literacy is, is the key. Many different uh, scientists, small group of scientists over the last 30, 40 years, starting with uh, Len and C.C. Doak. The Dokes were probably the first people who started this. And they started this going back, oh, probably 40, 50 years ago, where they realized that, gee, you know, we're not communicating really well. We tell patients what to do, but do they really understand? And then I reflect on my own background. When I was a young kid and my grandmother, who spoke no English, so she'd take me to the doctor with her, okay? So I'm eight years old and I'm translating, okay? Is it likely she's going to tell me to tell the doctor that she has a vaginal discharge or a breast mass? Or, or whatever her intimate secrets happen to be. That still exists today, okay? So we have health disparities. We understand the social determinants of health. So we've kind of categorized all these things. We've written papers, but now we've got to connect the dots. And the dot connector is health literacy and cultural competence. The one degree that I needed to be a better surgeon general was that of an anthropologist. 
because ultimately it all comes down to culture. And where did I learn first about culture? Special Forces medic embedded in South and Central America, embedded with the mountain yards in Southeast Asia, talking to a tribal leader, winning hearts and minds, all of those terms that we've all heard. But, you know, just because I had a title and I was an American and I'm there, I mean, I had to earn their trust before I was able to uh, change any, anything or at least try and change things for the better. And so many of, this, many of those lessons I learned as a young man and then built on those came to fruition with maybe even greater importance as Surgeon General when you're trying to look at a nation that continues to have an increasing disease and economic burden largely related to poor lifestyle choices. But how do I communicate to those Africans, to the Africans, the immigrants, to the Hispanics, to the people from Northern Europe, you know, all of this, and, and all of them uh, have different uh, lifestyle choices. They eat differently, they buy their food differently, they cook their food differently. So that, that's the milieu we're dealing in now. And you as a lifestyle medicine certified physician <laughs> and, and, and the rest of us who work in that field, we recognize that that's really where the rubber meets the road. We have to be better communicators and figure out how to develop messages that will resonate with that person we have the privilege to care for so that we can effect that behavioral change. If we do that, we know it works. You take uh, asthmatics here who we work with in the past in the Southwest, and you look at the high incidence of asthma in Hispanic children, very, very, very high. But if you get into the house and you clean it, get rid of the dust, you de-stress the environment, you change the diet, what you see is over time, ER visits decrease, absenteeism decreases, kids learn better because they're not worried about their short, shortness of breath. I mean, little things. These are not, you know, like my staff used to say, yeah, but you know, nobody's listening and, and they get frustrated. And I'd say, well, look, you have to understand the American culture. Take your TV guide out, go look at your TV guide on, and what, what are the shows that sell? It's about an ER, it's about a trauma center, it's about a SWAT team, people serving lie, saving lives, acute interventions every day. You know, they solve five SWAT calls in an hour, they take care of three homicides in an hour. And I said, so there's no top 10 shows about public health, except on PBS and we're the only ones watching them, see? <laughs> and that's the problem. So, you know, you just have to understand the, the reality, you know, the reality of the whole thing and you just keep plugging away, but we make incremental change because of podcasts like yours, because of people who care, who are out there, trying to spread the word. In health literacy, you're right. I never heard that word in medical school. Mm -hmm. But it is so, so important today, no matter what field you work in, from public health to obstetrics to surgery, if you can't communicate with that patient and that patient doesn't understand you, what happens? They don't follow your instructions. They don't take their medications. They forget about their follow-up appointment. The rehab you told them to get, they don't do. And so part of that mounting disease and economic burden is because of that lack of health literacy. Hmm. So what can we do in our medical education or postgraduate education to improve our communication skills? Because I know when I, I, when I got out of the military, I was at Langley Air Force Base, and then I went to rural Colorado. So, mm -hmm. And my husband's a first-generation American as well. His parents came from the Philippines. His dad was in the Navy. And... <clears throat> So I understand those cultural shifts and differences because I was married into it. And uh -huh. what was interesting, though, the, we, I grew up in New Mexico in a, in a very poor area of eastern New Mexico. So I understand the Hispanic population. I had a large Hispanic population in western Colorado. And over time, when I started implementing more of the lifestyle, when I understood, I began to understand lifestyle and the crucial components of that and how to educate our, my patients. A lot of it was the how to do it. I could get the message across, but they were, didn't understand how to do it with their special needs and their circumstances, exactly what you're describing. So what can we do in our education system? In, is it a, a CME courses? I mean, what can we do to help our physicians? Because we're literally dying every day. I mean, I, I see this as a sense of urgency. So, Well, it's all of the above. I mean, if, you know, if we look at something contemporary, for instance, um, you know, you go into some of our impoverished neighborhoods. So like where I grew up in Harlem, which is actually no longer, it's being gentrified. So that's, maybe that's not a good example anymore. But South Bronx, parts of Harlem, where you have a lot of poor people. 
say, well, you guys need to eat healthy. You know, you should get fruits and vegetables and, you know, make healthy choices. But there's no supermarket there, okay? Right. And so where do I get it? And in one of the studies we did up in one of the programs we have in the South Bronx, about half of the women in the program are single moms, okay? Yeah. And there's no healthy food there. And they're living on food stamps or not food stamps. They are got a minimum wage job with two kids, and they're just basically surviving. You know, if one bad thing happens, they're, they're gone. They're, they're homeless again. So that's one population. And then at the other end, you have very wealthy people who are in another part of the country in any, in any given city. It could be New York or Beverly Hills, L.A., whatever. And they still have obesity and they smoke and they make bad decisions. And they have the power to change it, but they don't want to change it. And then I, I run into people, a surgeon general and before, who, you know, like somebody who has type 2 diabetes, and you try and counsel them, and they go, yeah, yeah, but you know what? I'd rather just take the pill. It's okay, because I like what I eat, and I like the lifestyle. When I was Surgeon General, uh, I used to confound some of my staff because I always would look to engage people as I traveled around the world. And when I was like on the, in, in Washington, and we're going down either Independence or Constitution, where the Smithsonian is, and all of the buildings are there, the secretary's offices for agriculture and so on, and interior. And I'd stop, and I'd see people sit standing outside of their building smoking. Mm. And I would stop the car and, you know, my assistant, well, well, sir, why are you going in there? I said, I want to talk to these people. They go, oh, here he goes again, you know? And so I, you know, because I felt, I felt like almost like I was a preacher. Mm. And, I, and I would stop and I give, I give you the composite of hundreds of these I did over the years. Somebody would be smoking. I'd go, hey, how are you? And I'd be, I'd be in my, like, a, let's say, a, you know, it's in the summer. I may be in my summer whites. Okay, so I'm in uniform. I'm a flag officer. And I'm stopping. The security guys are going crazy. What are you doing? So I said, uh, hey, sir, how you doing? And he'd say, look at me. Yeah. Hey, how you doing? I said, hey, I'm the Surgeon General. Literally, the guy says to me one day, ah, oh, no shit. Really? And I said, yeah. <laughs> and he says, so I said, can I ask you a question? I said, um, how come you're smoking? And he kind of looks at me. He said, I like it. I said, can I see your cigarette pack? And you take it out. And like, maybe it was Marlboro. It didn't make a difference. And I said, you see down here at the bottom of the cigarette pack? where it says, Surgeon General says, I said, I stay up all night and sign these so you won't smoke. Well, why are you smoking? And, but I did it to start a conversation. Right. And I would go, well, you know, Doc, I tried. I can't quit. It's like I stopped for a day, and I always carried in my pocket a 1-800-QUIT card because mm. the federal government put a quit program. And I said, even if you don't have insurance, call this number. We want to help you stop smoking this. And most of the people were very happy with that. As you know, the success rates are terrible. But right. nevertheless, we had something to try and offer. And I talked to your primary care provider, et cetera. But I have probably a quarter to a third of the people who look at me as they blue smoke in my face and say, I'm an American. You can't tell me what to do. It's right. my choice. I said, well, you know it is, but let me ask you a question. My choice is I don't want to have to pay for your lung cancer or your emphysema. So how do we reconcile that? Okay. Mm -hmm. Are you willing to take out a bond to care for your last 10 years of life when you have emphysema, shortness of breath, you need extensive medical care, maybe you need surgery, cancer therapy that costs hundreds of thousands of dollars. And often for us who are in those um, senior positions where we are in that intersection of uh, policy and execution of that policy with Congress and stuff, it's interesting because what it always comes down to is the right of the individual versus the collective right of society. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's always, a, whether it's stem cells, whether it's abortion, whether it is cigarettes, it's that individual right. And it's what makes democracy great, but also confounds us on a daily basis. Right. So to your point, how do you get to that person so that they understand that we engage them and they go, oh, you know, I got it. And, it, and we can't legislate all of those things. You know, people want to put soda taxes and candy taxes and all these things. That's, you know, the long term, that's not really the answer because we learned that in prohibition. You can tell people you can't drink that, but they're going to go find it. And in fact, what we found in prohibition was the very people that wrote the laws to prohibit you from drinking, they drank themselves because they figured out how to get their own alcohol. So we have to be smarter. And again, it comes back to that health literacy. How can I develop messages that will engage people, that will inspire people. How do, how do I um, embed myself in a community that that village chief, uh, like in the combat zone, or 
the local preacher who may be the, the opinion leader believes me. And I, and I give you some tangible examples of that. When I, when I was surgeon general, a lot of times we have the CDC, NIH, HRSA, SAMHSA, all the federal acronyms, they're getting together, we're writing reports. And, and I always say to staff, well, how are you gonna do this? Well, we're gonna go in there, we're gonna go to the YMCA and do this, and we're gonna go there and tell this, and we're gonna send memos and we'll distribute the reports, all good stuff. But I said, but how's it gonna resonate? And I, and I thought back to my growing up in, in Harlem and the Bronx, and I said, well, who are the opinion leaders? If you went out on a park bench, on a sunny fall, summer uh, day, there'd be a bunch of the elders sitting on a bench. And most of them are grandmas who are just mm -hmm. sitting there talking. And they are the most important persons in that community because they really are the matriarchs. They're the ones watching the kids in the street. They know who should be in the neighborhood and so on. So I told the staff, I said, you know what I would do? I would go and earn the respect of those abuelitas, grandmas sitting on that bench. And then what could you tell them that would motivate them? If you told them that their cooking wasn't good, they'd throw you out of the neighborhood. If you told them they were buying the wrong food, they would be offended. But if you sat next to them and said, you know, I grew up in the neighborhood here and I got a concern. My concern is that your grandchildren aren't going to live as long as you'd like. Your grandchildren are going to have a lot of disease. And if you could, if you could help me, I think we can change this. It's going to take a little time. And we've done some of these programs. And so what you see is all of a sudden you have an army of the most powerful opinion leaders because these are the matriarchs of the community. You know, in many communities, as you age, you don't get put out to pasture to a nursing home. You actually become more important as you age because you're revered for your knowledge. So let's tap into that knowledge. You get those grandmas together and they are sitting on that bench and they're telling kids, you can't eat that, you have to eat this. And they're the ones making the decisions. They're the ones going to the store. And then you can tweak, you know, well, like my grandmother used to make everything with lard. You say, you know, this is stuff, vegetable oil. Maybe we can use olive oil. You know, there are things you can do to start changing the culture without offending the culture. Mm. When I was down in Katrina, I had, you know, monumental task of trying to deal with hundreds of thousands of people that we had to evacuate. There were uh, 300,000 people we evacuated from that area. And what they have in common, most of them were on the lower end of what we call the social determinants of health. Poorly educated, didn't understand their disease process, a lot of obesity, a lot of type 2 diabetes, a lot of cardiovascular disease, but now there's no pharmacies, okay? We're in the water. There's no docs, there's no EMS system, everybody left, but these people still have needs. So I'm thinking, how do I get a message? Should the Surgeon General just send an email to everybody? Oh, most of these people don't have computers, okay? Mm -hmm. Well, do I mail them something? Well, there's no mail. Nobody's delivering mail. How do you get to them? Where do they go in, the, in their good times and their bad times? Mm -hmm. They go to church. Mm. They go to church. The pastors. Okay. And down there, these are the, um, uh, for instance, the Baptist ministers. And they have groups that they get together, these ministers. So I went to this group of ministers and I explained who I was and said, I'd like to help. Can I help? And I got, it, and I got trust. And they said, okay, Sunday, you come to our service at this church, which is still open. And we're going to introduce you and you can talk to our flock, of which huge. Because, you know, people who um, are committed to their faith, in good times, they interact with those faith leaders all the time. And in bad times, they seek the comfort and guidance from those people. Mm -hmm. So let's be smart. So I go there and he gives his first five minutes of sermon. And he said, now, y'all, I want you to listen up good because <laughs> Brother Richard is here today to talk to us. And Brother Richard is going to talk to you about important things that are going to save our lives. I had instant credibility. <laughs> I had instant credibility because this pastor gave me his Billy Pulpit and basically gave me instant credibility as Brother Richard. Wow. I can't tell you how many hallelujahs I got as I gave my <laughs> My sermon on health and what we needed to do to stay healthy today. Don't drink that water. Get your vaccinations. Listen to your health provider. We're going to get you evacuated to Texas. And it helped. It didn't solve the whole problem. But because I had the credibility, people changed behavior yeah. because I asked them to based on the intro of the most important person in their life, their pastor.
So, so there's is, tangible examples. So it's just a network, you know, they, they talk about social contagion and yeah. influencers. So this has been my thought is like you have physicians that were in this social network, right? We have authority, we have respect, but if we can get the message disseminated, if we can learn how to disseminate that message and get involved in those communities that we're already embedded in. Our kids are going to those schools. We're going to those churches. Yeah. We're yeah. driving down the streets every day. Our, our spouses are working in our communities. So do you think it starts with our medical education as far yes. as the dissemination? So how think, do we? I think all our health professionals need to understand. We need, we need to have more education, training, experience with uh, health literacy and cultural competence. Because it's not just how I communicate, it's understanding the culture you're communicating into, okay? Right. They, they go hand in hand. You, you can't do one without the other. So one of the best training grounds in the United States for our U.S. public health officers who are probably the experts in health communication or health literacy and cultural competence is the Indian Health Service. Mm. Because our officers... We have 565 federally registered tribes around the country. And one of my responsibilities through one of my colleagues at the time, who was a two-star admiral who ran the Indian Health Service, okay, was that's our responsibility. But then you go on the res you go to Navajo Reservation, Pasquayaki, Tohono O'odham, Apache. You sit with the tribal leaders. They're still having their meeting in their native language, okay? And so it's a third world country. I mean, it, the Americans, they're the real Americans, but yet, how do I break through that? And I mean, and the old joke was, we used to tell you, do not go to the meeting and say, I'm from the federal government, I'm here to help you. This doesn't <laughs> fly, okay, for obvious reasons. But if they see that you have heart, you have compassion, that you really care, and it takes a while to develop that. You know, when, when I was a young special forces medic, you know, you want to get in there real quick, do your MedCap, Medical Civil Action Project, do great things and leave. It doesn't work because they want to know who you are. They want to know what your values are. They want to know what do you think about kids and family and, you know, all those things. And so you earn the right. So our public health officers who are embedded in these Native American communities, they become part of the family. They're not looked at as a, a visitor anymore. Well, that's, you know, and, and, and you're smart. Um, when I was Surgeon General, a number of times going to the reservations, I drew on my own experiences as a Special Forces medic, combat medic, in, in the combat zone dealing with the mountain yards, which are essentially the Indians of the hills people in Southeast Asia. And when I'd sit and you break bread with the village chief, and who's there? There's a healer there, a shaman. There's spiritual healers. There's all these people. So you didn't tell them what to do. Often, you listen. And then I'd say... I have that same problem. Can you tell me how you deal with it with your people so I can bring it to my people? Mm -hmm. Now you open a door. You have mm -hmm. a relationship. You start trusting each other. And as the trust builds, you say, hey, you know, here's what I do in my home when this happens. You start mm -hmm. sharing information. They bring out herbs. They have incantations. They have things you never even thought of. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's a placebo effect. Maybe it's not. We don't know. But if you're not willing to engage and have the trust, you're not going to be successful. But it's not any different than going into a high minority, low social determinant community in the United States. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of mistrust because they feel they've been abandoned and people don't care. How do I honestly, not, you know, not gratuitously, but honestly embed myself so they understand and then start that journey to changing behaviors and, and it's going to be bigger than that because how do I act, how do I get the food? There? How do I access healthy food for these folks? How do I teach them to walk every day? And in the, we have some, some just unbelievable programs that we've done, but, and they take years to do, but you start seeing social networks that are um, forming. You see moms who are now helping moms, babysitting for each other, helping each other find jobs. And you start to see over time, you see kids that are absent less. So moms have more time, to you know, do their work and do what they have to do, get an education. And these are little incremental things that ultimately the outcome is improved health, lower mm -hmm. cost, kids who can learn. And so it's just being smarter. But to your point, if we don't start educating our health professionals, mm -hmm. pharmacists, 
nurses, physical therapists, because at every point in the health system, when one of the, our fellow citizens interacts, because as you know, you may come into the system through a nutritionist, through a doctor, through a nurse, through an NP, through a PA. Mm -hmm. So if each of us understand that, then you know how to make that first engagement and start that navigation process through this complex thing we call a health system so that it will benefit. So I, I think that's the key. And so health literacy, cultural competence uh, for, you, you know, your viewership who haven't been involved, Google it. You can see it <laughs> right, here, right, right here in my bookshelf here. And I just wrote the preface to another book. In fact, let me grab it. I'll show it to you. Okay. Um, this book's hot off the press. It's health literacy and, and it's new directions in research theory and practice. It's by a, a colleague of mine, Rob Logan, who is at the National Library of Medicine. So he's a federal employee. But this, this book is up, most up to date. And I wrote the preface in this book. But here, Andrew, Andrew Pleasant, who is a, a doctor who works with me, PhD doc, who was a journalist who went into public health, one of the most prolific authors and scientists in the field of health literacy and cultural competence. So there's a lot of information out there. It's just that in our traditional education, we really don't give a lot of lip service. We talk about, for instance, noncompliance in patients. When you look at noncompliance, the proximate cause is usually, I failed to convince you what you needed to do. Mm. So... You know, how many times do we see patients who, you know, um, I can think of a lady that came into for resuscitation one day and the daughter said, yeah, my mom, she doesn't speak English too well, but they told her to take four, two of these tablets every day and she forgot for three days. So she took them all together because she didn't want them to see that the bottle. And so these were antihypertensive medications. Oh, okay. Wow. So, so, I mean, you see this health literacy challenge embedded every place in our society. So um, it's the pharmacist who has to communicate. Uh, it's the nurse practitioner. It's the physical therapist. So as I see the perfect world in our, what they call today, medical homes, I don't like medical home. I think it should be a health home, okay? That no matter what point you enter the system, you're hearing consistent messages about uh, health literacy, cultural competence, uh, engagement, inspiration, you know, and, and getting you to the next person who's going to help you on that journey. But that's what this is all about. And so to your point, I think that we need to do a much better job in all of our education for health professions because the doc is not the only one. I mean, we all play a role, you know. Right. And so, and for me, we all play an equal role. Some days the physical therapist is a lot more important than me and the pharmacist is as well and the nurse is the one at the bedside 24 hours a day in a hospital mm -hmm. when the doc makes rounds for 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. so we have to just put it all in, all in perspective. And in addition, I think we need to spend a lot more time uh, understanding what we used to call complementary and alternative medicine, which now we talk about integrative medicine. What are all these other practices? They're not complementary any longer when more than half of our citizens use discretionary money to buy them. They're pretty mm -hmm. mainstream. My grandmother would roll over in her grave because she'd say, what do you mean complimentary? My people have done this for generations, okay? Whether it's wearing an amulet, whether it's incense, whether it's herbal medicine, you know, and sure, some of it may not work. But if the people believe it works, you have to approach it in, in a good way. The good news is at our National Institutes of Health, we have a national center for complementary and integrative medicine. So I, I always tell people, if you're not sure something works, go on the website, put the Q word in, and a lot of times research has already been done to give you direction because mm -hmm. people get confused because they watch the infomercials, okay, at midnight. Oh, take this pill. It's going to make cancer go away. You're going to look 20 years younger. It's going to help your sex life. And so you take your last $10 and you buy the bottle, which is worthless, you know. Right. So we have to do a better job of educating, informing, and making sure that people have a place to go for, for scientifically vetted information. Right, absolutely. That is delivered in a health literate manner. So that, I mean, when you look at the big, pro, the big picture, like I can't even imagine as you step into the role of Surgeon General, there's so much encompassing our society and our, the chronic disease burden. And you can, I mean, there's, you could just look at obesity and that's, that is a full-time job for a 10,000 people or diabetes, which is going to cripple us economically. And yes. I don't even know how we're going to recruit for our military. Yeah, and, 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 I, exactly. So 
we have these, this growing problem, literally growing problem, and we know what we need to do. We need to bring in health literacy. So where do we begin as, you know, you and I or other people who, who want, or my daughter who's in medical school, where do we start? What is the beginning point of one person? Is there, you know, to begin that translation or that change? Because it does take a team. You're exactly right. That's what I always tell people. I said, I learned more in medical school sometimes from the nurses who were in the ICU when Absolutely. I was doing my right. rotations, because let me tell you, there were many times, you know, my anal sphincter tone is really tight at those moments, you know, so, <laughs> but those nurses are right there by the bedside. They're the ones talking to the family. They're the ones that are, yeah. in, you know, they're the ones that are speaking the language oftentimes yeah. of that patient. Um, so where do we begin? I guess, how, is there a, a starting point for someone like me who's out of medical school or a nurse or is there somewhere well, where do we I go? Th I, think, I think that your job, my job, is to raise awareness mm -hmm. as to how important this issue is. It is a currency. It is, it is a method that we all need to know to communicate whatever our specialty is. Mm -hmm. If you're the physical therapist uh, manipulating a bad back or a joint that's just been replaced and you're imparting information that's critical to their outcome, how, how often should I exercise? What should I do? Why is it important? Okay, all of those things. And if you're trying to impart that to some new immigrant who has no idea that you just put titanium into their knee. I mean, you start thinking about the, the complexity of the issue. So you have to be wise. And, you know, you, I think the, easy, the way I always tell, um, you know, people that I had responsibility for is as best you can put yourself into the shoes of that person. What's their educational level? What's their culture? Where did they come from? Are, are they going to understand the, you know, the five letter acronym that you sh shout at them for some, something, you know, well, CMS said did, and NIH did this, you have no clue. Okay. And even Americans don't. I mean, in fact, when you look at the literature, even educated Americans is estimated over half of educated Americans are health illiterate. They don't understand how their behaviors ultimately tie into their outcomes. Okay. Right. And it's getting more complicated because when you and I went to medical school, Obesity was just, okay, you're overweight, you know, we had a body mass index, and if you dismember, you're overweight, and the reason you're overweight is because you eat too much or you don't do exercise. Mm -hmm. Now we know it's a whole lot more complicated. There's an endocrine problem. I mean, there's garins. There's all of these chemicals that we didn't know before, and then we get into genetics and epigenetics. You know, what do you, yeah, what do, you put, what do you program for, you know, mm -hmm. and what epigenetic effect will have on your genes? Mm -hmm. And then there's these hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of uh, bacteria that live between your mouth and your anus in this ecosystem that we used to ignore, but now we recognize without it, we die. Wow. <clears throat> you know? Absolutely. So how do you communicate? How do you tell somebody with a high school education, okay, or a new immigrant that, by the way, you've got a few million bacteria living in your gut that you need, okay? And they actually help you, okay? So, I mean, it, there, there are some real challenges, but once you and I and others can inspire people to understand how this is critical to us being successful. It is going to be more critical than any antibiotic, any surgery, any, you know, new advance in genomics, because mm -hmm. if people don't understand it, then they're not going to be able to incorporate those changes into their life. They don't feel it. And as we moving along, think about it. <clears throat> when, when I went to medical school, uh, which was a little before you, this, the, 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 the furthest advancement in science and genetics, okay, was the double helix and some guy named Watson and Crick, okay? <laughs> that was it. And it was like science fiction. And yeah, those, those two little wrapping things, they're in all your cells, and they kind of describe who you are. Think of where we are today. Right. I mean, I, in 2003, when I had the privilege to work with Francis Collins and Alan Guttmacher, we rolled out the Human Genome Project at the Latin National Library of Congress. And I sat at a table with Dr. Watson, Dr. Ventner, uh, Dr. Guttmacher, and, and Dr. Collins. So there in front of me was the human genome, 50 years, okay? And I, today I still get goosebumps when I think about it, you know, from double helix, and now we're actually – into the understanding of genomics, epigenetic, pharmacogenomics, nutrigenomics. So as we wait, it gets more complicated as we're right. trying to educate people as to the importance of what you're bringing up. So the starting point is, 
awareness. Uh, the deans, the various uh, regulatory bodies for our medical schools, nursing schools, need to be putting this information in there. And more and more, this needs to be the center because we may be the smartest people in the world. You may have a Nobel Prize. I may have done something great. But if I can't communicate it, who benefits? Right. Exactly. <clears throat> And if we're not putting it in practice. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to be respective of your time. I know we just have a few minutes left, but if there was, you know, sometimes I like to ask doctors, if you were the surgeon general, what would you do? <laughs> but since you've already been there, if there was one or two things that you could just instantly change, like you knew that would have the largest impact, at least in at least American health or, you know, basically the world, what would that be? What would, what do you think that would be? Well, I, I, unfortunately, I, I would say um, many of this would be easier if we didn't have the bipartisan dysfunction. Mm -hmm. So I've written a couple of papers, one, one uh, interesting one, which I call Prevention, Preparedness, Plagues, and Politics, the Life of the Surgeon General. And, and the, the paradox is the greatest plague I faced as Surgeon General was not emerging infections, wasn't obesity, it was politics. Mm. Because you, it's very difficult to have a rational discussion on any scientific issue in the Beltway because it becomes politicized. People point fingers at each other, the parties blame each other, and then policy is not promulgated. And as you see playing out before us now and in the past, again, this is bipartisan, each side takes its own position and the, the concept of, um, democracy, which is predicated on compromise, is not done. And so because of that, everything else follows. So if I can't get good health policy, if we're arguing that, you know, Obamacare is good or bad, or Romney care was good or bad, you missed the point, okay? Forget it, okay? Let, let's, let's look at what, what are the incremental variables that are contributing to our disease and economic burden, and let's address them, okay? Mm -hmm rather than getting into debates over which political party is right. So I think that's it from the Surgeon General point, that's a very important issue. Mm -hmm. Because as Surgeon General, you're, you're the doctor of the nation. You're not the doctor right. of the Republicans or the Democrats. I used to joke with my, co my 535 colleagues up on the Hill. I'd say, you know, when I was a trauma surgeon and we get a gunshot wound in, nobody ever asked for a Republican trauma surgeon or a Democratic trauma surgeon. <laughs> you just went and took care, think in combat, right? Right, exactly. Asked, when I was a young soldier in combat, and I think of my friends who were killed, and I think of my friends who live, and I think back of those years when I was in combat, to this day, I don't know what political party any one of them was in, because we all went downrange as Americans. We didn't go as Republicans or Democrats. We went downrange because you guys who got elected said it was the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. okay. So getting rid of the politics and being able to have a strong Surgeon General, I think, is important. Over the last uh, couple of decades, the position has been um, marginalized. So there, it's hard. There is not a Surgeon General who can stand up and say, no, that's wrong, because yeah. each party now tries to bring in a Surgeon General aligned with their political interest. That's not good. The Surgeon General should be like a Supreme Court Justice, uh, in, in, at least in theory, that you know, you inform on policy. And whatever the science shows, that's what it is. And as I used to joke with my elected official friends, uh, tongue in cheek, you know, when I say, yeah, I'd say, um, I'm the one, I'm the doctor of the people. I get to tell you what I think the best science is. You guys get to lie about that science, okay? And, and so, I mean, it's a, it was a tongue in cheek, but in a, in a, in a, in a not blatant lie, but it becomes politicized. And so right. you shade it. You know, global warming, stem cells, abortion, and yet let, let's start with the science and then let's figure out how do we apply that science to the greater good of the nation where we know we're not going to appease everybody, especially the extremes on both sides, but we can get two-thirds of the people under the bell-shaped curve, okay? And the challenge, of course, is the extremes are what's running politics in our country now, not the average person who lives a little left or right of center. So I know that's a political answer, but it's also a health answer because without having professional informed discourse on issues, we can't solve the problems because they have the authority. Surgeon General doesn't have the authority. I have the authority to inform and sometimes move things along. So that would be one. The second thing would be that I would say 
Health literacy, cultural competence needs to be embedded into every single health curriculum. And at the other end, going back to when I was a kid and we had health economics in school and you learn how, activities of daily living. You learn how to buy food, how to read a food label, how to write a check, pay your bills. Mm -hmm. At this end, if we get the consumer understanding, then they can demand from the health professionals. Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't understand that. Explain to me how this drug works. Mm -hmm. Explains to me why I need surgery and I should, and why I, I don't think I should have surgery. What, make the case for me, mm -hmm. you know? And so I think if we can increase demand on the patient side, that will force practitioners to not feel offended when, or a patient says to you, you know, I'm gonna get a second opinion. That shouldn't mean that I don't trust you, but this is complicated enough. I want another sp person to tell me that it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. So those would be my top two. Depolitization, um, people in Congress acting not for self-interest, but for selflessly for the benefit of the people that they ostensibly represent. Mm -hmm. And then embedding health literacy, cultural competence into all we do so that the science doesn't keep moving further and further away from the people that need it. Right. So almost like you would have, I think, term limitations on our senators and representatives. Mm -hmm. I am for that, honestly. Um, but do you think a, a separate office of a Surgeon General that's not appointed? Well, well, if you read some of the things I wrote, I said, I think it's the president has the right. And I think, but if you look at all the Surgeon Generals, Army, Navy, Air Force, that really you come up through the ranks and then when you reach those senior ranks, the flag officer position, mm -hmm. then your, com your commanders in those services will send the note to the president and say, here are our top three or four candidates for the position. Okay, mm -hmm. That's how the Air Force Surgeon General gets there, the Army Navy. The president still makes the nomination. Congress is the checks and balance because even though the president nominates you, you could die waiting on the list because if Congress doesn't like you, you can't go anyplace. Okay? Right. And yet, in the public health service, what they've done is to more politicize it now. They mm -hmm. select people who aren't qualified, haven't had the experience, don't have the gravitas, because the parties are trying to get somebody that is going to be aligned with them politically. And that's mm -hmm. wrong. Mm -hmm. The person we want there is a person that you don't know what party they are in, in my opinion. Okay? Right. That's not important. I want the smartest person who's got the most experience, contemporaneous with the threats we have in our world today, and I want them to always tell both sides of the aisle the truth. And then those people should have a discussion as to how they operationalize, execute on that truth. Mm. That's what should happen, rather than yeah. having it shaded one way or another. And mm. really, that's, that's what's happening today. And so my, in, in previous publications, I have written that the Surgeon General process should be apolitical, other than that the president gets the right to nominate. The Surgeon General's office should be funded independently and not subjected to uh, the whims of Congress when they don't like what you say. And that's the way it is now. Mm -hmm. So if you look at uh, the um, Supreme Court, if you look at certain uh, critical positions to the infrastructure of the nation, they have a separate budget that is fixed for years. Congress can't mess with it. So now if the Congress didn't like what the Surgeon General was saying or doing, they could cut your budget. Your, your driver could retire tomorrow. Your access to the internet could be cut off. So the, the point is, is that it, it, if you really are a democracy, then you want the best qualified person in that position who will always speak scientific truth to power. And if we don't know the answer, we'll say, we don't have the answer to that yet. We need this study or that study. Right. That is what serves our nation best, but it wow. doesn't necessarily serve either political party best. Right. Absolutely. Hmm. And then on the other spectrum, you're just saying maybe starting on an educational level with our children. Because yeah, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I'm, I'm encouraged today, you know, uh, because I see that, um, uh, you know, there's, there's certain trends that are happening. We see uh, the uh, almost the explosion of farmers markets and it's the younger people, the, the really, uh, you know, our millennials, for instance, mm -hmm. They're looking, they go, well, you know, I don't want all that corn fructose. I don't want monosodium glutamate. I don't want the extra sugar and salt because it's going to sit on my shelf for a week. I'd rather go to Joe's Market on Saturday morning, okay, and the stuff was just picked yesterday and get my fruits and my vegetables and, and get um, fowl or beef that is not uh, hormone laden, you know, mm -hmm. or, or, or stuff filled with insecticides. Mm -hmm. So uh, 
I'm, I'm encouraged with those trends toward uh, healthier choices, mm -hmm. uh, but it's not the sole answer. I'm encouraged with um, some of the youngsters I talk to today who, um, including my youngest uh, daughter, who a number of years ago, when these debates were raging and I was uh, just finishing my Surgeon General tour, and she said, Dad, I have a question for you. You know, you, I hear you talking about the debt ceiling and the politics and the problems we have. And he says, well, why do you guys care if I take a birth control pill? Why is that a political debate? If I take a birth control pill. And yet embedded in an answer like that is to me an understanding of what are the important issues before us. Okay. And so in Washington, stem cells, abortion, plan B, global warming all become politicized. And if you have an opinion that's scientifically based and contrary to what's politically correct because of a given party, then you're the bad guy. And you get demeaned and diminished and marginalized. Shouldn't be. But I'm encouraged when I talk to some of these young kids who are going like, you know, you old guys, you're wasting your time. You're arguing over all this stuff. And one kid said to me, it's kind of like, uh, Rome's burning and Nero's playing the fiddle, you know, and it's like, <laughs> and in effect, there's some truth to that, you know, yeah. let's stay focused on what's important and let people make some decisions for themselves. You know, as I point out, when I speak on these end of life issues and some of the politically charged issues that are around life, first thing I will ask a group is define life for me. There is the challenge. I'm not saying that your rabbi, your priest or your mullah is wrong but we each look at life mostly through a theological lens because no science can tell you when life begins. Mm. Is, it, is it two cells meeting in a dark place, you know? And, <laughs> and, you, you know and, and I said, or is it when you first see a neural system or you see a little heartbeat or you mm. see movement in the uterus? I don't have the answers, but I know enough to respect the values of whoever the person is who's asking that question. Mm. And it's not, it's not skirting the issue, but in a democracy where you have such a diversity of understanding and there's no scientific answer, we have to back up and say, okay, I understand your, your theological approach. Let's discuss, you know, how this fits into the bigger picture. Right. But think about how it gets played out in Washington. Right. So, you know, the, how many times do you go to church a week and, you know, and you're not, you're not religious, you're an atheist. Well, you know what? As a Surgeon General of the United States, I am responsible for atheists as much as I am for devout Christians, okay? Because you have the right to be an atheist here. I'm not saying you should be, but if that's your choice, am I going to give you less care because you're an atheist or a Jew or a Christian or a Muslim? No. Right. And, and I think that's the beauty of being a doc or a Surgeon General. You know, right. I, I may believe one thing, but I, I, res I respect your right to believe what you think about health. I may disagree but I'm an American, you're an American, that's your right, okay? As long as you're not encroaching on somebody else's rights or hurting somebody, mm -hmm. okay. And, and yet that, that, that enlightened approach I see much more in the youngsters than the ones that are very entrenched in their politics, as we see playing out in Alabama now and a few other places where it's very extreme. You know, and you're going, really? Wow. I mean, the rest of the world looks at us and goes, the inmates are guarding the asylum. <laughs> Yeah. That's exactly, exactly right. Yeah. Well, on that note, <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for your Dr. <laughs> yeah, on that note, <laughs> that's going to be, that, that may be the quote that I fill out. <laughs> the inmates are guarding the asylum. Because there's always that quote, they'll, they'll put something out of context and you go, oh my gosh, here we go. <laughs> no, no, no. Oh my goodness. But thank you so much. I went a little bit over time. I apologize. But thank no, that's you so okay. Much. I enjoyed our conversation. Thank you for what you're doing. And I, you know, it's, it's uh, people like you who are willing to take the time, whether it's podcasts or articles and, you know, influencers in our community that, right. you know, will help to change the, the, the way this is. And uh, I think we need to uh, continue on this journey of enlightenment which is neither Republican or Democrat or, you know, or independent. It's mm -hmm. just that this is America. And, mm -hmm. you know, we, we've created a nation where you have the right to worship as you see fit and understand it's our job as physicians to be able to inform our fellow citizens maximally so that they can make an informed decision that's in their best interest. Right. Absolutely. They have, to have all the information to do they that. They do. 
Yes, absolutely. And, and good health is a fundamental right. I think yes, they have the right to that. So absolutely. Yes. But thank you so much. And uh, I'll just stop the recording one sec. Well, thanks very much.